Good afternoon. Merry Christmas. Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us a special returning guest, one of my absolute favorite oh, people. Special. I That was in air quotes. Ethan Nicole <laughs> from the Babylon Bee, creator of Axe Cop. Uh, and his new book is called Chesterton's Gateway, which is a selection of essays by Gilbert K. Chesterton, which I have read and I'm very excited wow. to delve into. And I wanted you here for the Christmas episode. And I actually had, first of all, I want to congratulate you. It looks like you've lost a ton of weight. Thank you. I'm not quite a ton, but you know, like uh, 50, 60 pounds. That's how did you do Probably it? From, and, and, and why? I, I checked into a weight loss clinic locally and started a, a program. Did you really? You went <laughs> so, to fat yeah, camp? full on. Yeah, well, no, no fat camp. I might need that if I fail again. But okay. uh, you know, I might need to check in with Ethan Supp Suppley. Is that his name? Yeah, Suppley. Yeah, uh... I mean, he can help me out. Get, like an Ethan weight loss program going. Well, I think that's absolutely wonderful and good for you for uh, attending to your health. The Anarchist Handbook thank you, thank you. Was, was dedicated to my book, Eric Dixon. And he, I mean, you were nowhere as big as him, but he had to deal with obesity, you know, all his life and he passed away at, before the age of 50. So Ugh. anytime you're never too old to be like, you know what? I don't have to be Arnold Schwarzenegger, but I could be better. Yeah. Um, and it takes some work, but I, I think everyone listening to this, it's you're worth it. So was it hard yeah, for you? That's well, the, that is the hardest part. The hardest part is like thinking, because I mean, I've been a fat guy since I was eight. So it's hard for me to imagine myself not being proportionally this size. So oh, you're getting still, in the oh, mindset. You're still, you're, you're still the fat guy. Let's be clear. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still fat. <laughs> okay. But to you're, not think of myself, to think like, <laughs> that's not who I have to be. That's not, this isn't me. Like it doesn't, it's not part of my personality. You know? Yeah. You know, I, I had a similar thing all my life. I had stomach issues. And I, you know, I tried different things, nothing helped. And then I had a friend who had um, colitis. I think it was colitis or whatever, uh, um, you know, where they take out a piece of your intestine, like really serious stuff. And he mm. recommended um, probiotics. Mm. And within like a week, something which had been my identity in one sense, all my life had been resolved. And we all tend to think that just because something has been the same way all our lives, it's Im impervious and we're going to die this way. And it's right. really not the case. Yeah. I heard you just eat meat and everything gets solved. Yeah. That's the Michaela Peterson plan. Yeah. But yeah. So let, let me, let's talk a bit. I want to, this, I had a little imaginary conversation with you uh, mm -hmm. about Christmas and I, 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 I want to hear your thoughts on it okay. because first of all, my understanding is that Christmas is something that in terms of Orthodox Christianity and, and the Bible is certainly uh, have gotten a much bigger platform in America than it is in terms of the faith. The Bible is much more focused on Easter, Christ's resurrection, his, his, uh, his dying and coming back from the dead and all those days accordingly. On the other hand, I think the Christian message is Christianity at its best, which is benevolence, kindness, you know, well-wishing. On the other hand, I'm an octopus. It's like, well, yeah, that's kind of, but that's kind of missing the point. The point of Christianity is we're all going to fall short without Christ. So you could be as nice as you want, but that's still, in a sense, irrelevant. Uh, it's like making the icing, but you're not making the cake. So what are your thoughts on Christmas as a holiday? Oh, wow. We're going, we're going deep right off the bat here. I mean, well, I think you, you nailed it pretty well. You know, I think uh, it is the idea of that the world needed saving. And I think it's the celebration that this is God coming into his creation and becoming a, a human being. And, uh, and so it's that, you know, that we were lost and uh, fallen without him. And uh, for that, for him to come and to, to become human uh, is such a kind of amazing, shocking thing. Uh, man, I wish I had, because we're talking Chesterton, he has the best. <laughs> it's really long, but uh, in Everlasting Man, he talks about the impact of the Christ story uh, in his, the second part of that book. Um, and so I think that's it. I mean, gosh, I feel so inadequate as like a theologian type guy trying to get this to you. I think Dan's probably twitching over there. 
Good. That's Maybe what I like. Answer for that, me. That's what my Christmas present, making Dan Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Up yours. <laughs> No, but on a personal level, like, is, is this not, do you not take a certain sense of pride in, you know, not pride, but like, there's that sense of joyousness and brotherhood, which I think is something we could all use a little bit more of. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Brotherhood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is, this I'm is a gonna... terrible interview. I don't know how, why you have me on. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to tell me that. <laughs> or the audience, we can see it. Let's let's talk a bit about the Babylon Bee before we delve into Chesterton. Okay. Explain to me, and again, you're not a spokesperson for all of Christendom. Uh, right. on, the, on the one hand, there is this kind of culturally Christian idea that you shouldn't use swear words, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and that's something a lot of I, you know, I have friends who are you know born again, and you know, you speaking as a former New Yorker, you'll say something they'll be taken aback sometimes, which I can understand. Uh, you know, uh, this kind of contempt for vulgarity, or not contempt, but like uncomfortableness. But at the same time, some of the pieces at the Babylon B are <laughs> so vicious and, and <laughs> savage. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'd rather someone just call me an mf -er than write an article <laughs> like this about me because I could never recover. Like, do you see how, how do you reconcile those two things? Um, well, yeah, let's look into that. I think, uh, I mean, I think that we, I, I, I think that the, the Babylon B's jokes Part of the thing is that there is that myth of of niceness, which uh, I think is a it's 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 like a, a small rule, like a like how am I trying to say here, like a, a custom. There's a bigger there's a bigger thing there to be to be followed uh, in in the idea of loving your neighbor and seeing other humans as also human or also children of God. Uh, I, I don't think just being kind of polite and nice goes the full what goes the whole way uh i think that there there is i think a lot of us i think most of us all of us here believe that when you joke with others you're putting them on your same level it's not oh, for sure you know what i'm saying like uh you're not reducing somebody by joking with them or about their idea because i think one of the things about the babylon b when we got to start making fun of christian culture sure our own thing that we hold sacred and everybody within their uh, ideology has portions of it that seem uh, crazy, or or there's cultural things that have come into them uh, that seem crazy. And you know, like there's there's things within Christian culture, like prayer circles and worship leaders and smoke machines at church and things that uh, you know they deserve ridicule. And uh, it's it's fun to sit back and ridicule those things. And I think that we want to. We try to hold that standard for everybody <laughs> and so when we you know when somebody says men can get pregnant too well we'll ridicule that you know that's part of your crazy ideology <laughs> and uh okay you know i think it's uh it's not a I, I think we want everybody to take themselves more lightly which is also goes back to chester he said angels can fly because they take themselves lightly uh, so i think that's part of it and there's a certain dignity and uh, I, I just think the moment you can't joke about somebody, you put them into a category that isn't a brotherhood, back to brotherhood. They're not your brother. They're some kind of weak creature that must be, you know, handled with kid gloves. So I think that, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it's somewhere in that, in that realm. Yeah, but I think a lot of times when you, I'm talking about I, I, the Christian stuff when talking about Christian culture, because it's very clear Christian culture and, and Christianity and the Bible are separate things. There's a Venn diagram, but for everyone at certain points, like, okay, come on, you know, like when you've got <laughs> yeah, the right. shirtless guy in the leather jacket singing about, you know, Christ, <laughs> like this is the Christ stuff is secondary. You're more interested in putting on a show. I'm sure there's mm -hmm. like Chris, Chris Angel, whoever it is in, in Christian rock. That's Chris the same Angel. thing. <laughs> there, there, I'm sure there's a, a Christian rock equivalent of Chris Angel, uh, who's He's a magician. Who, Right, but I'm sure that you guys that'd be crazy. Some... A Christian Chris Angel. He's like walking <laughs> on water. Well, it's like that, it's like that Ned Flanders joke about how there's a, there was a Christian rock singer and they call her she's the Christian Madonna or Rachel yeah, Jordan. <laughs> right. Yeah, they have to make their knockoff of everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but like I'm talking about specifically when you're going after like politicians right. and certain things that they've done, like the Cuomos or things like that. Mm. 
it's not doesn't feel at all like a sense of brotherhood. It very <laughs> right, much right. feels like going for the juggler, <laughs> and like you guys, you're a horrible person, and we're holding you to task to, uh, for it using our humor. Right. And I and I think that uh, sure, I, and, and there are jokes that Babylon Bee makes that I don't. I would go, eh, that's a little far, or let's say, uh, but uh, in general, I think that we make jokes about the caricature of the person. So for one thing, I think that to us, like we're joking about the, who are they in the ether? So who is the kind of cartoonized version of this person? You know, AOC, super dumb, um, Pelosi, you know. So uh, I think that's part of it. I see us as kind of joking in the realm of that, the satirized version of them. Sure. Um, and and I think that is that's a place we go for. We go for hypocrisy. Okay. So when there's like clear hypocrisy. We want to call it out. Um, and also like the thing nobody's saying. You know, like the no one else will make this joke. And I think that that's that is like the sweet spot for the Babylon Bee is like no one's making this obvious joke. Someone has to make this joke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's it's it, I'm often taken aback. I'm not gonna lie. And I'm just like. <laughs> I'm like, and I will pray, and I pray for you all, <laughs> because I'm like, oof, I don't know, man, I don't know how they sleep at night. That's but, funny. This is coming from Michael Malice. Yeah, like that's your name how, is Malice. Let's, but let's talk about Chesterton. So I'm very glad that I read this book because I had a very strong animus toward Chesterton, um, <laughs> and I had lumped him in unfairly okay. with C with C.S. Lewis. I think for a lot of people, they occupy the same kind of mental space that they're you know, Christian yeah. apolog apologists. Uh, they both have fantasy fantasy novels. Um, they're both from around the same era. Um, and, you know, they both have a similar view of man and his place on Earth. Mm -hmm. But after having read this, I w the things I didn't like about Chesterton, I liked even less. But mm -hmm. there's a lot there that I really did like and appreciate. So why don't you tell us, you know, who he was and why you decided to put this collection together? Yeah, that's, I mean, opposite. I was a C.S. Lewis fan. And then I was like, you know, I've read like a bunch of C.S. Lewis books. I should read Chesterton. I guess they're the, the same author, basically. Yeah. So I started reading Chesterton and I realized he's way different. Uh, oh, yeah. And they weren't contemporaries. Uh, I think they were alive partially for the same time, but he was before C.S. Lewis and he had a big influence on C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis credits his book, The Everlasting Man, as being uh, instrumental in his coming to faith because um, it was the first time he'd really seen so many intellectually and originally uh, talk about faith in history, in the real world. They're not using old arguments. They're not going straight from the Bible. He's just looking at history, the world. He's looking at uh, the the way that we skew things uh, to fit our modern worldviews, and he knocks those things out and uh, kind of helps, kind of reopens your eyes to them. So I think for me, when I started reading Chesterton, for one thing, I mean, off the bat for me, Chesterton was like a 300-pound illustrator. So uh, <laughs> we had that in common um, when I found that out. Uh, he's incredibly funny. And I, I had never read somebody from 100 years ago that made me laugh as much as Chesterton. And he says things that seem so obvious, uh, but he says them in such a way that make you go back. So, for instance, he talks about things that seem like they should be Hallmark card ideas, like wonder. You know, the first essay I put in the book is about two boys. It's a little fantasy short uh, essay. Two boys who are given the opportunity to make a wish and they're in this little tiny garden in their front front of an apartment complex or whatever and uh, one wishes to be giant the other one wishes to be a pygmy the giant strides off and basically turns the world into another version of his tiny garden that he's already which he's already bored with and he just kind of dies like the uh fairy tale death of the giant he just gets tired and lays down and has his head chopped off and uh and then the the boy who decides to be tiny suddenly the his, he sees the, the little garden for the wonders that there are really there. Basically, he puts himself back in the correct proportion to his universe. And, uh, you know, it, it's all the old tropes of pride, humility. Um, but he does it in such a way that, you know, I was going through this time when I discovered Chesterton where I really had, I was in a depression. I was uh, right on the verge of uh, probably leaving my faith and just kind oh, of wow. become a nihilist. And uh, 
and that and that that was big for me suddenly kind of like re-looking at the world i'm in right now this very place that i'm in um and kind of with new eyes so i think that's a big one for me for, with chesterton and that's just kind of the uh the tip of the iceberg of chesterton's philosophy is we have to start from this place of wonder at the world that is even here um you know i love this <laughs> i have a bunch of quotes in front of me just if i can pull them out but uh you know he says uh he says, a thing may be too sad to be believed or too wicked to be believed or too good to be believed, but it cannot be too absurd to be believed in this planet of frogs and elephants and crocodiles and cuttlefish. And that's actually a character saying that from, uh, oh, I think it's from The Man Who Was Thursday. But uh, just that idea that there's, you know, that's a common argument that, uh, oh, it's just, you know, that's too absurd to be believed. We don't yeah. look at how absurd the world is <laughs> and, all, you know. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. We all want to make sure our family's protected in a medical emergency, but what many of us don't realize, health insurance won't always cover the full amount of an emergency medical flight. Even with comprehensive coverage, you could get hit with high deductibles and co-pays. That is why an Air Medicare network membership is so important. As a member, if an emergency arises, you won't see a bill for air medical transport when flown by an AMCN provider. Best of all, a membership covers your entire household for as little as $85 a year. AMCN providers are called upon to transport more than 100,000 patients a year. This is coverage no family should be without. As a listener of our show, you'll get up to a $50 e-gift card with a new membership. All you got to do is visit airmedcarenetwork.com slash malice and use offer code MALICE. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. Want to take a second to talk to you about a sponsor that I think is doing a really good job, and that's Fume, F-U-M. If you go to breathefume.com slash malice, you get 10% off your order. What is Fume? Fume takes the benefits of super plants, behavioral science, and beautiful design to make it easier to stop smoking and vaping, and you're going to be saving a lot of money. They have a new holiday box. It's really cool. What you get is the fume, which is carved out of olive wood. There's no moving parts. It's got this pretty unique grain. And there's four cores that come with it. There's a snickerdoodle one, eggnog, spiced orange, and candy cane. And it's limited to 1,500, 1500 items. I'm a collector. You know how that stuff works. What's great about fume is that it replaces that hand-to-mouth motion that smokers are addicted to, that ritual after you're eating you when you're at a party you want to have something in your hand you want to be doing something with that to replicate the sense of smoking fume allows you to do that it's a great way to get your health back in order and save money if you go to breathefume.com b-r-e-a-t-h-e-f-u-m.com slash malice 10 you get 10 percent off your order or you can just use malice either one they want you to be healthy and so do i let's get back to the show I've made that point when I was on Rogan, when I, and it's, it's almost verbatim, the exact same point. When I was a kid, I could never watch Star Trek because I was a big zoology person. And, you know, when you think about what's at the deep sea and all the aliens and monsters there, and your version of an alien is a guy who's blue. <laughs> I, I, it, 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 I mean, you laugh, but as a kid, this right, angered right. me because I was so aware of just on earth. Look at the Venus flytrap. It's insane. Right. And, and that's native to North and South Carolina here in the States. It's a, it's a plant that somehow eats bugs, whereas the bug has a very big incentive <laughs> on not being eaten by yeah. a plant. And it's still figured out how to do that. And it's and, pretty slow. It's bizarre that they, they pull it off. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's not like they're made out of steel. It's right. a leaf. And it doesn't, it doesn't go, you know. Well, like, no, it does. Oh, does it? Does it, it snap? It does. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, you, okay. Yes, yeah, it's not. A, so, it's something called um, RPM, rapid plant motion, I believe is the term. Okay. But basically, how a Venus flytrap works is they've got, I think, three trigger hairs. So if one is triggered, nothing happens, right? Because it's a breeze. It could be, you know, dust, detritus. You have to trigger, I think, two within this time period. And how the plant moves is half of the leaf grows at an extremely fast rate. And hmm. by making one half of the trap grow, it effectively closed itself on the plants. So it'll, it'll happen within like a second. So it's right. quick enough. One um, second, though, still, that's... For a plant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and I'm just saying, like, how hard it is to kill a fly. Oh, yeah. Fast and kill it. Oh, yeah. So yeah. it's 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 absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah. But again, so that, but the thing that bothers me about that essay a lot 
is and this is why I think this is what, you know, this is much more prevalent in C.S. Lewis than in Chesterton. I think C.S. Lewis has a much darker worldview um, is it's it's literally belittling. You don't have to make yourself small, like to, like the wonders of the microscope, right? You, you, uh, who is it? Uh, uh, whoever the first person to discover the microscope was, I forget his name at the moment. You know, he's looking at a drop of water. And he's seeing like, I mean, monsters and then yeah. realizing that's in all the water and it's been here since time <laughs> immemorial. Right. Um, so I the, that premise of to me, that story of that sense of wonder of the universe, which I think is something that sense of what I call whimsy. I don't mm -hmm. think it's I think it's pre pretty much the right term for it, which I adore and venerate and, and I constantly promote. But to have it contextualize in the sense of having to belittle yourself is the opposite because the way I see it is what a blessing I have that my little brain physically little and then whatever has the capacity to understand both black holes and paramecia right yeah I, I and I think I don't think he's saying you have to belittle yourself it's more I think it's that you're seeing yourself at your true size. And so I think it's an analogy that in the scheme of things, how small you really are. And then also that that's, uh, but you're not insignificant. I don't know. You could, uh, yeah. Well, I, th I think a lot of that kind of that, that Christian sense of humility is about, you know, there's this contradiction and I, I obviously it's, you're not gonna say it's a contradiction, but like two uh, thoughts at once, which is a, you know, get over yourself, which I think is true. Like you're not mm -hmm. the center of the universe, but at the same time, you should, your life is a gift and you should take mm -hmm. it seriously and you shouldn't just be frivolous with it. And this is your one shot to, you know, do something and you should thrive or at least right. to the best of your ability. Yeah. That, and that's another, uh, one of Chetron's arguments for his faith is that, uh, he, you know, he talks about, uh, how, uh, not contradictions. <laughs> now I'm blanking on the, uh, the word paradox. Yeah. You know, that there are two ideas, you know, the complexity of life is that there are often two truths that are true at the same time. Um, both that you are tiny, a tiny little speck, uh, and that you are significant, uh, that your life has meaning. So there are, you know, these kind of two coexisting truths. And that's one of his big, um, criticisms is uh, of a lot of philosophies is they they stick to one idea whether it's if it's prog if it's progressivism it's just pure progress or if it's uh if it's naturalism it's you know it's pure you know everything's just particles and uh evolution and then you have to throw all these other things out anything that uh that, that doesn't work within that system and so i think he he went towards christianity because it it holds both truths. It holds both uh, full full mercy and full judgment of sin. Okay. Um, one of the things that I also really liked in this book was this, um, which was really uh, just a great idea for anyone, is the analogy you use, which you, you had in your introductory uh, introduction, which is how hilarious you should recognize you, yourself when your hat flies off in the wind. And yeah. yeah, and you're running after your hat like an ass, like in a cartoon. <laughs> and instead of being frustrated, like, oh, where's my darn hat? Take a second, realize how you come off to other people that you're being a buffoon, but that this is a good thing. Like you've yeah. made everyone's day a little bit better. Bring in joy. And, yeah. And if, if the worst thing that happens is you have to run for 10 seconds, is this really that much of a crisis in your life? <laughs> right. Yeah. And he has a whole essay called uh, On Chasing After One's Hat. And that's, uh, yeah, it makes that whole analogy. And once again, it's there. there's a very hallmark card version of that, but there's a lot of so much truth to it that, uh, I th you know, his, you know, he says an inconvenience is only an unrealized, uh, I'm butchering his quote here, but uh, an, un an inconvenience is only an, uh, an unrealized adventure, an adventure unrealized or something like that. And kind of the opposite too, that uh, an adventure is a, seeing inconveniences for what they really are. I'm like, I'm, I'm once again, I'm butchering. I'm the guy that made a Chesterton book and I'm butchering his quotes. <laughs> if you think that's bad, I've never read any anarchist books. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, you know, the, the point I make to people, I, I like, I'll say, I love having a bad time. 
Like if I go to a restaurant and it takes you half an hour to get seated and then the, they get your order wrong and then the food's cold mm-hmm. and then the waiter's an ass and then something and then the people at the next table or whatever. At a certain point, this becomes great because right. instead of having merely a bad meal, now I have a story that I, and <laughs> right. I'm creating a memory with my friend for the rest of our lives. It's a bonding experience. Like, hey, remember that? Because you're gonna get the you're gonna you're not gonna be hungry forever. This is a first world problem. And uh-huh. you know, just think about <laughs> think about how silly this day was. Right. Yeah, that's I, mean, I have a story from the first time I was on your show. Because I was I couldn't find a place to park and I was <laughs> lost in New York and I was all frazzled and I needed to go to the bathroom and then I had to like get a haircut to get you it was in that episode, but there's a whole thing. <laughs> um, what there's something you didn't talk about in this book, and this is something that historically has people have forgotten about, but there is a big overlap, especially in his era with people like Woodrow Wilson, between Christianity and some variant of socialism. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the slogan, what would Jesus do? was written by a explicit Christian socialist. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's where kind of cancel culture comes from, from the book called In His Steps, um, which is still uh, very widely read today. Are you familiar with Chesterton's idea of distributism? And what do you think of it? I'm familiar-ish. I've not read his, like he has a full book about it. And that's, I always get a little bit lost uh, when he starts talking about that. I, one thing I, we did just recently, I've reread because I have you know, a group of guys I get together and read Chesterton, and uh, we read What's Wrong with the World, uh, and that's his book on kind of what we're getting wrong. And uh, he, did, he only at the end starts to kind of play out what he thinks would be the right way to do things. But you know, the point of the book isn't to get into that, because that's a whole other book. Uh, but one thing I'm struck with, and I was thinking about this when I was thinking about talking to you, is I, I wonder if anarchy has kind of the same issue. To make the case for it, you have to convince everybody Nope. Like you can't just convince half half the population and then force everybody else. No, that's not it at all. Uh, for example, if I have, let's suppose I have toll roads that are private and I have government toll roads that are more expensive, I don't right. need to persuade you of anything. You just have to have that choice and be like UPS or postal service. Right. There's no ideology involved. It's just people are going to make the preference. What I mean to reform, like to get the current system to change over to anarchy. Like to convince- no, no, that's not true because the majority of people are going to have no input whatsoever. So if you're, if you have, if they were, if the same people were born in Iran, they'd be jihadis or they'd be at least right. hardcore Muslims. If they were born in the Soviet Union, they would tell you Papa Stalin is the best thing since sliced bread. So mm-hmm. they will follow the cur- currents of the day regardless. Um, the reason there's so many, per- if, if, if it was not the case, then ideology would be kind of distributed evenly throughout America. But you see that in cities, it's going to be heavily progressive and rural rural areas, it's going to be much more conservative. So it's a function of your surroundings, not a function of the veracity or uh, lack of veracity toward a given worldview. So if there is enough, and anarchism just means leave me alone, right? So mm-hmm. if there's enough people and the costs of forcing them to do things becomes too high, uh, they are just going to be left alone, even though no one's persuaded of anything. Like, I don't need to persuade, like you and I are in an anarchist relationship. I don't need to persuade you of anarchism. I know that if you or anyone at the Babylon Bee, except Dan, who's terrible, if I left, <laughs> if, if I left you in my house to house sit, <laughs> You're not going to steal anything from me, and you would find it unconscionable. So, but I don't right. need to persuade you of anarchism of that. It's just, it's just a very basic sense of respect. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm talking in the in the sense of like trying to reform like your actual. I mean, the not the whole world, but at least like your country. Sure, uh, I right. think to- I I think at the, again at that point is look at the founding fathers. They weren't they were, How many of them were there? Mm-hmm. Like a hundred, two hundred. So if you just had those 200 men and they said I, there was not at all the case that the majority of people wanted a revolution. I mean, they were perfectly ha- sure they had to pay the taxes, but, you know, the British aren't that bad. I mean, it's not like mm-hmm. the Kaiser or, you know, 100 years, 200 years later. So but you have enough people who are like, we're going to do this. Everyone else just gets excited and go hung and go about it. I guess what I'm really trying to say is, you know, there's certain there's certain systems of government that you want to get in place. And part of that system is to force people. And so when you have a system where you don't want to, fo- where you're, you're not, you don't want to force, you want to convince people. All, that- all you have to do is make not, you don't have to convince them anything. If you have an electrified fence, 
Mm -hmm. right? You're not convincing the cows of anything. They just know if you, if you tread, you're going to have consequences. So right. you can continue believing whatever you want, but you are, if you don't respect my space, you're going to have consequences and you don't have to be persuaded of anything. So at right. that point, you could just have a small minority. Maybe it's not going to change all of America, but enough will be like, all right, we're just going to be left alone because, and, and there'll be you know condemned oh you your guys are crazy that's fine i don't need you to not think i'm crazy i just need you to leave me alone i'm not challenging i'm trying to sympathize with you <laughs> but i mean like for if you if, for example if you like utah like here's a, a good example utah's right. heavily mormon they didn't persuade america that mormonism is great they're just like mm -hmm. all you have to do is just respect our right to have our faith uh many christians consider them heretics that's mm -hmm. fine you don't have to be persuaded to joseph smith you just have to respect our right to worship and our right to live as we choose and everyone's like okay cool yeah yeah i agree so that's this that's so the, the, but you're not right. no one's going to say that a majority of americans or yeah. even a significant percentage are mormons yeah and i'm not comparing the two like distributism which i also i, I don't fully grasp what he's trying to I, I, my best understanding is it's communism he wants everybody to have a certain amount of land he says you have the right to property Right. That's communism. Right. And, so and, that's, and that of, is where I get, that's where I get, I, I lose him there. Uh, Dale Alquist, the uh, president of the Chester Society will debate you to, on this one. And uh, he's way, he has a way better understanding of it. He's all in. Uh, but I, I do admit when it gets to that part of, of what Chester is talking about, uh, I get a little, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I love Chesterton's heart and I want to like understand where he's going with it. <laughs> but I fully admit I'm not the best spokesperson on uh, distributism, which even like just that word sounds bad to me as a, uh, yeah, it sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like a, like a shell game, like a yeah, yeah. switch. It's just fascinating because I don't think Americans appreciate and it, because we tend to look at our contemporary historical div uh, political divides and project them into history and like it doesn't map out at all like who are the progressives yeah. in the civil war the nationalists or the the, or the slave owners it's it's really neither and the same thing with chesterton who is unquestionably and we're going to get to that in, in the next question one of the great conservatives of all time but at the same time if you didn't say this was chesterton and put forth his political model people be like, this is Bernie Sanders crap, take it back to Russia. It's not, it's not literally <laughs> communism, but right. it really is this idea that like every all property has to be kind of divided up among everyone, which would require, if not a central authority, at least a very strong sense of collectivism among right. the population to allow this to happen. Uh, one of Chesterton's, Chesterton, in my opinion, gave the best metaphor for conservatism with his uh, uh, story of the fence, which is where mm -hmm. you got your title to this book. Can you right. break down that uh, uh, metaphor for people? Yeah, the uh, illustration is called Chesterton's Fence. And he says, suppose there is a fence or a gate. In fact, I even have it right here. Uh, you know, you're walking along and there's a fence in the middle of the road. And uh, he says the progressive uh, would tend to be like, oh, this fence is just in the way. Let's tear it down, get it out of the way. And he says the the person who should tear the fence down is the one who understands why it was put up in the first place. And that's the only person who should tear it down. And then, because what if there's like a giant gorilla behind it? He didn't say that, but that's what I think. Yeah, it, it's it's that if something, I think his point was, I think he says it explicitly, if something was built, there must have been a reason for it at some time. Right. And until you know that reason, uh, and you're destroying something or changing it, you really be better be damn sure you understand why it was there to begin with, because you're going to be opening up, you know, to mix metaphors, Pandora's box, and mm -hmm. you don't know what's why that fence was there. And we all, t the other thing that I think that's great about that in terms of conservatism is that there's this very leftist idea that everyone used to be dumb and now we're all smart. Right. And, and this, <laughs> which is just nonsensical, but yeah. especially with the people who are affecting change in the past, well, even the thought leaders were dumb. And this kind of blows that out of the water with his premise. Like, you know, people did things for reasons and yeah. to just arrogantly say, ah, I don't understand it. Therefore it doesn't make sense. You're really, and that is where his humble uh, humility and belittling would, would be important. It's like, take a step back. You're not mm -hmm. the great genius of the ages. Someone did this for some purpose. Yeah, and he also he ties that in because he's talking about tradition there, 
and he's talking about how, uh, you know, I like democracy. And he says, he starts talking about the democracy of the dead. He says, he just considers tradition democracy of everyone who's lived rather than just the people who happen to be alive right now. And the reason these things are, have been held as important are because mankind has voted on them. And uh, so they should be taken seriously at least rather than just kind of, you know, one of the very simple quote he says, that I love that he says about progressivism, my attitude towards progress has passed from my antagonism to boredom. I have long ceased to argue with people who prefer Thursday to Wednesday because it is Thursday. Yeah. Hey guys, Michael Malice here. You might know me as an author, as a Twitter troll, as a podcast host, but I'm also an underwear model and certified hunk. And you could get one step closer to being a hunk like me by wearing sheath underwear. All you got to do is go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code Malice. You get 20% off your underwear today. It will be the most comfortable underwear you will ever wear. And I say this because I wear sheath every single day. What makes sheath unique is their dual pouch technology. So it's got one pouch for one part of your male anatomy, another pouch for another part of your male anatomy. It sounds nuts, ha ha, but I'm telling you, once you try it on, you're like, oh, this gives me the comfort and support that I've been looking for all my life. It's also very breathable. They've got a new mesh boxer brief, which helps you keep that flow, airflow, so you're not get sweaty and you know what down there. If you go to sheathunderwear.com and use promo code MALICE, you get 20% off your order, which means added comfort, added performance, added mobility, and added hunkiness. Take it from a stud who knows. You ever feel like you're being followed around the internet and maybe advertisers know a bit too much about you? So IP Vanish VPN helps you take back your privacy and helps you become anonymous on the internet. IP Vanish is a virtual private network. It's a VPN for short. You can use it on your computer, tablet, phone, even your Fire Stick if you're streaming media. When you use a VPN, all your data is encrypted. That means what you're reading, what you're watching, and what you're searching, whatever it is you're doing. It's important because what you're doing is no one's business but yours. For listeners of the show, IP Vanish is offering an incredible 65% off their annual plan. It's only $375 a month. Super easy to use. Turn on with one click. It runs in the background to protect you while you're browsing. And if you boomers run into a problem, they've got 24-7 support by email, chat, and telephone. If you go to ipvanish.com slash malice, use promo code malice, M-A-L-I-C-E, you get 65% off. Their annual plan is only $44.99 for the first year with our discount. Now's the time to sign up. And IP Vanish is the best of best. They've got a 4.7 out of 5 rating on Trustpilot with over 6,000 reviews. Remember, it's ipvanish.com slash malice to get the deal and start protecting your anonymity online. Let's get back to the show. Uh, one, so he died in 36, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as toward the end of his life, you know, things were going in a very bad direction around the world. You have Hitler in Germany. You have mm-hmm. the Great Depression in America uh, and worldwide. Um, and the modernism, which he's not a fan of at all, I think it's fair to yeah. say, is definitely in the ascension. Christianity. He also hated socialism too. <laughs> the, yeah, well, that's the, that's the where I get you know lost with it. his distributism. I go, you hate socialism, but then this dist- um, yeah, it, you know, it, Dale Alquist could answer that. Um, <laughs> what from what your perspective? What was his like as things were you know towards the end of his life? What was his perspective on uh, the state of the world? Um, he, I, I don't have the quotes in front of me, but he, uh, before World War II happened, he pretty well c- predicted it was coming and what would happen. Um, he was, he was a singular voice against eugenics in his time. Uh, one of the very few when it was all sexy and cool. Yeah. Um, and he talked about what it would lead to and he was very accurate. <clears throat> so that was, uh, that was a big one. So he, he saw things headed in a very bad direction and, uh, he predicted a lot of things that came true after his death. So it's amazing one thing that's amazing is to hear him talk about progress, the fads of uh, of socialism and all these things, and to, and he's saying this before he doesn't have Hitler analogies, you know. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of amazing to me. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, did he speak at all about the rise of the Soviet Union, which would have been the last twenty years of his life? I, gosh, I don't have it. I, I know that he said something to the effect of that the uh, that war would break out, I believe, in Ru- that there would be another great war and it would start with Russia, I believe is what he said, something like that. But I'd have to look it up. But he made a very accurate prediction to how the war would start. One of, one of the uh, 
books he's best known for is The Man Who Was Thursday, which is subtitled A Nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, I read that many years ago, and I you allude to it in this book. I, I like you, couldn't really make heads or tails of it. Yeah. Um, I think you, you also, you and I also agree that simply because something is hard to parse, that's not in and of itself proof of its genius. Sometimes yeah. things that are hard yeah. to parse are just not good. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> what, what is your view of that book and why do you think it's held in such esteem? Yeah, that's interesting. Cause it is like a, it's a great, well, I do think that it's the last chapter that everybody kind of goes, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> you think you're following along. <laughs> yeah. And I actually had a guy explain the whole thing to me one time and he like blew my mind. But I, if you haven't noticed, I'm bad at remembering things I've learned. And I don't know if that's like my personality, but I'm really good at making stuff up, but I'm not good at remembering things I've learned. Okay. And so my, uh, I'm not a good person to talk about things like that you're supposed to remember. Okay. Uh, which is bad for interviews probably. But, uh, so, but yeah, Man Was Thursday. I mean, it does have a great premise, this whole idea of this undercover cop guy going into this group of uh, anarchist bombers. And he keeps finding that the next guy is actually also an undercover cop. And kind of a, there's a comedic element that's very fun. So it is a fun read. Um, but yeah, at the end, uh, many of his novels do this. It's a very trippy ending. He's got this whole analogy he's going for. And I'm like... Uh, I don't know what he was going for there, but uh, it was a fun ride. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think this book is still read so widely today? Uh, Man was Thursday. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I mean, that that one's a bit of a mystery to me. I don't, I don't think it's a bad book. I do like it, but I do feel like it's like I get lost, like I said, with that last chapter. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for that because I also don't. I'm not a huge fan of his uh, his detective stories. They're good, but I don't think they're his best work. But they're like what he's known for. Father Brown is like one of his biggest. Uh, you know, I like. I really like when he gets in his faith. I think because, I think because, so many Christians, and I think conservatives. This might be a pet peeve for you too with conservatives that they're afraid to be original. They want to borrow. Oh yeah. Uh, they play it safe. Um, Chesterton was pretty brave in just, he, he came up with his own arguments. He, his arguments were very personal and original to him in a lot of ways, or at least the way he told them. Um, I think that was a big one for me because I, you know, I'd been reading all these books on reasons to believe. And a lot of them are, they're either so kind of dry or they're kind of fitting into one frame of, of view, pure reason or whatever it is. And, uh, that's what drew me into Chesterton is he's just such an original thinker. Um, yeah, yeah. And speaking to your point, I think that's the thing. A lot of these reasons to believe are reasons that believers would find reasonable, but they're not persuasive to non-believers. Like one of the things that really bothers me about the abortion debate is you can't go to someone who's pro-choice and be like, you're killing a baby. And they're like, oh, well, what? Oh, like that's not their perspective. That's not going to be persuasive. Right. What was really interesting about Chesterton is he came to his faith later in his life, mm -hmm. um, at, specifically to a Christian faith. And for him to have that happen as a very intelligent, well-read person, he was then in a position to be like, okay, this isn't because of mom and dad. I wasn't raised mm -hmm. in the church. I came to it as an outsider. And here is why I think these ideas and this worldview is in fact true. Yeah. yeah and he takes you on the journey of what led him there, uh, which isn't always the way people do it. And orthodoxy is that, and it's very, it's, uh, it's not step by step in the way that, uh, that you would expect. He, you know, like I say in the book, he paints pictures. He thinks like an artist. So he does some over here, over here, over here. And I think that it, it comes together, but it's not the uh, bullet point, uh, make right. a point, repeat it kind of way of, of, uh, argument that we're used to. But isn't that kind of a big aspect of Christianity that no one's going to sit you down and give you a PowerPoint presentation and you're going to be like, all right, I'm sold. Like there right. has to be that inspiration from the Holy Spirit, that so-called leap of faith. And it is, you know, you know, the Bible obviously is replete with fables and stories and things like that. Uh, it's not a dissertation or anything, anything of that sort of sort. And everyone I know who, you know, 
it has a is a Christian, they do have that kind of artistic moment where it's you know just a vision or something right. touches your heart. It's not going to be you know you know I read Joel Osteen and I'm like <laughs> sign me up sign me up Christ I'm I'm here for you. <laughs> right, I think a lot of apologetics is like supplemental. It's like uh, if you're getting doubts, you you can throw these in there and it makes you feel a little more like uh, you're not crazy. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I don't think you're argued into it by pure reason. And uh, even that's, and that's Chesterton starts off his book, Orthodoxy, with the idea that pure reason is a madness of itself. If, um, you, you, can, you can take any philosophy and fit your entire world, worldview into it. That doesn't make it right. And you know, it says lunatics do that all the time. So there's, it's, there's more to life than, or there's more, to, there's more to be found. And uh, you're, you haven't solved everything by creating a watertight argument. I guess. Yeah, it? that that was a very good analogy because uh, like if you're talking, for example, you had a friend who is this is the kind of stereotypical crazy person who thinks he's Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And if you go to him and play gotcha and like, where's your stovepipe hat? He can <laughs> yeah. tell you with a straight face, it's 2021. No one wears those anymore. So <laughs> if, if it's so again, if you do have this kind of internally consistent ideology, that's it's very hard to snap the person out of it, even using logic or, or something mm -hmm. like that. You need something more. Right. Why do you think he, he his legacy has lasted so long? Um, I mean, he's so quotable because that's one fascinating thing about Chesterton is he really doesn't have a Narnia. He doesn't have like a the big book, you know, um, an epic <clears throat> that you can make into a movie. So he's kind of like lasted despite all that. And and one of the biggest ways he carries on is he's so quotable. So he gets quoted in so many things. There's been a big resurgence in the last 10, 20 years, I think, of Chesterton. And I don't know, I, I, I know that a lot of that can be attributed to uh, the Chesterton Society. Dale Alquist founded, uh, he created it and just started kind of reintroducing people to G.K. Chesterton. And I know it came through that, through Catholics. Um, and then I think uh, popularity of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien you know, yeah. you can only read so much of those two and you start looking elsewhere too, you know, uh, and he kind of fits into that framework of kind of creative Christian thinkers who thought outside the box um, and kind of had their own voice. I think um, they were artistic, they're creative. Uh, they talked about truth, goodness, and beauty. And uh, yeah, I think he, he's in that realm and it's sad that there aren't more uh, giants in that in that realm i think in the christian faith well i think it's also interesting because even though he's writing roughly around 100 years ago you know give if you take a few decades on either side it's still extremely readable he wasn't yeah. high in, on his own bs like trying to sound like i, I don't know if you're a fan of it, but like buckley was mm -hmm. you know intentionally using unnecessarily big words to try to present himself as smarter than he was chesterton very much you know and even though he's british Mm -hmm. you, it doesn't read like a British person in the sense that it's it's hard to follow his prose. Uh, and it, it, when you read these essays, he's very, and you uh, mentioned this in your introductions, that sometimes it's hard to follow because he's not writing linearly. He's basically, mm -hmm. you know, taking the, the reader on a journey through his mind and like, hey, this is cool. And also this, blah, blah, blah. blah. <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's um, exciting when you're reading someone who is an intellectual who's taking you by the hand and wants to show you around his musings because he, I, he never comes off to me as like wagging his finger. Right. It always comes off to me like, this is what I think. I'm firm in my beliefs um, and, and and come along with me. But there is this welcoming aspect, which I don't feel is necessarily there when you read C.S. Lewis, who I feel mm -hmm. is much more uh, rigid and condemnatory and, and, and kind of um, barren in terms of his view of, of the darkness of the world. Yeah, Chesterton is just super playful and yeah. uh, he doesn't take himself seriously. He really does despise the people that take themselves too seriously. Um, yeah, like the best way that I've kind of tried to paint the picture of how I see Chesterton is it feels like a lot of those authors, uh, you're, you're hiking on a trail and they're, they're way, way up ahead of you. They've, they've, you know, they're up the hill and they're talking about things uh, and kind of flaunting that they've already seen all this stuff and they're way ahead of you. And Ch uh, Chesterton is actually like way back behind you and you can kind of faintly hear him going like, wait, did you guys see this plant? Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, and he's, 
he's actually saying things that are 10 times more brilliant, but he's moving much more slowly along and just like taking it all in and uh, in this very humble way. And he was a journalist technically, but he had, he loved to ridicule journalists as a, as lazy and, you know, so he, he had that sense of humor about himself and about his own work and about uh, kind of the self-importance of, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, modernism experts were, you know, that, this is kind of like the age of experts yeah. and uh, they're, you know, being just being kind of worshipped for whatever they, whatever they said became, you know, law and uh, he just hated that and drove him crazy. There was an essay that I really liked in there when he was talking about like um, the the laws of of, of Elfland uh, and living mm -hmm. with the elves. Can you? And it really did have this sense of whim whimsy and wonder. Can you mm -hmm. uh, talk to us a little about about his thoughts on that one? Yeah, that one's always been a. I love that one. I have a hard time exp putting it into my own words, but my best understanding of that is that as he's he's talking about our world. But he's he's talking about that we live in a fan in a fantasy world. It's you know we it's only that we uh, you know he has this analogy where he talks about uh, we're not we become adults we're not strong enough to exult in monotony like a, the way a child does. Uh, and he says it's possible that it's possible that God hasn't become you know too tired to exult in monotony. Maybe he does excitedly tell the sun to come up every day and he enjoys it. You know, and we act like because a thing repeats. We just take it for granted and act like, uh, you know, yeah, it's just that just happened. So that's science or something. Um, and so he, uh, so he's trying to reframe our perspective on the world to not take all these things for granted, apply all these laws to them uh, that uh, that explain them, but maybe they don't. You know, it's uh, you know, there's th there's things that we can explain. Like he says, like for instance, he says, uh, yeah, in Elfland, two plus two always equals four. But there's no reason why, you know, apples that have to be red, they could be any color or tigers hanging from, by their tails from trees or whatever. And he, he talks about the reason we, 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 we write fantasy, we create the unicorn because we've, you know, just to remind ourselves how amazing it was when we realized horses exist. You know, yeah. Add a horn to it. <laughs> and then suddenly it's cool again. You know, and uh, so he's trying to bring us back to the, the idea that the fantasy worlds we create they're just kind of like a little layer added on to what already exists and is already amazing. This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Pettisey. I love hearing people's stories of resilience and grit. This is why I created this podcast. We are very excited to welcome Jim Gaffigan, Yasmin Mohammed, Glenn Beck, Tim Dillon, Abigail Schreier, Jeff Garland, Ayan Hirsia Ali, Sam Harris, Heather Hying. Jonah Goldberg, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Greenwald, Sarah Shahi, Colin Quinn. If there's a culture of victimhood, then let's tell stories of grit and survival. Subscribe and listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, it's just because we understand the mechanics of the Venus flytrap. <laughs> it's not still badass to see this plant eat, eat a bug. <laughs> like, right. I get what it's doing, but holy crap, this is it's akin to magic. So mm -hmm. that sense of, uh, do you think that that sense of wonder and whimsy is worse now than it, or the loss of it is mm -hmm. more now than it was during his time? Yeah, I think we feel like because we have so much information at our fingertips that we're so uh, educated and smart because we can Google whatever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, there, that, that, the arrogance of believing that you're, the age that you're in is the, is the smart one who has everything right. I'm amazed how many people fall for that. Well, you think they're falling for that or you think they're getting like counterfeit intelligence accordingly? Because if this is the yeah. age of smart people and I'm here, therefore I've got to be smart yeah. by default compared to the days gone by. Right. Yeah. I mean, they're falling for the counterfeit intelligence. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I was really surprised. What was his, how was he perceived during his lifetime by his peers? I know that his, you know, like I know Bernard Shaw, George Bernard Shaw, a lot of his contemporaries loved him, H.G. Wells, guys he completely disagreed with on everything. Uh, they were all good friends. Um, and that was a big principle for him, which was another thing I love, you know, the way he interacted and the way he talks about his ideological opponents with such love and admiration. There's a... Uh, you know, one of his debates with George Bernard Shaw, there's a, you know, it's all written down, you can read it. And they spend like the first three pages 
talking about how great the other guy is. <laughs> it's just kind of unheard of. <laughs> so there's that. And then, uh, you know, I think he was seen as a contrarian. Uh, and I think that he had that instinct that whatever everybody was saying, he said the opposite or he kind of just, you know, what, er, something everybody took for granted. He was huge. I mean, he took, he, he was doing writing, uh, speaking tours all over. He, he did two tours around America, I believe. Um, whenever he came to town, it was front page news. So it's fascinating in, in our age to think that that would be that big, but, uh, you know, they didn't have internet. They didn't have TV. <laughs> yeah. That's the, yeah. Gertrude Stein, who's uh, I'm sure it's, uh, Cheston was no fan of, uh, if you knew her work at all, uh, if you ever talked about her work at all, she did this tour of America and you think about it before, yeah, before radio, before really records and before television, the, the closest you're going to get to a concert or like an event yeah. is some thinker that you like Oscar Wilde, obviously this as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get to see them in person and get, and I can see how the appeal of that, like this yeah. is someone I read all the time and I get to see them in the flesh and yeah, hear real. off the cuff. It's, it's, I, that's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be thrilling. Yeah. And I want to clarify, cause I feel like I, I fall short as a Chesterton. I'm not, I'm no Chesterton scholar, if that's not clear, but uh, what inspired me to write this book was, I do, I mentioned just ideas from him a lot on the podcast, Babylon B podcast. And then another one I did called audio mullet. And I get asked all the time where to start. Cause a lot of people have a tough time starting and diving in. Um, and so I would always send out like a, a, a bunch of essays and explanations. It was always a lot of work. I started thinking, I'll, I'll, I'll make a PDF up or something. And it just turned into a book. So really my, my, my goal here was to make like a, uh, you know, a simple minded man's guide to getting into Chesterton. That was my 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 best attempt at that. One my of the full things goal. <laughs> let's talk, let's switch gears a little bit. One of the things you and I had the conversation about not that long ago was in reference to the anarchist handbook. And you said you were not a fan of Tolstoy, who is a hardcore Christian and was also an anarchist and I believe even a pacifist. What do you not like about Tolstoy? Well, in, in fairness, I haven't read hardly any Tolstoy. I only said that uh Chesterton mocks him a bit. There's a scene in uh, in one of my favorite uh, fiction books by Chesterton called The Ball and the Cross about a, uh, there's an atheist who owns a little bookstore and then this uh, Highlander Catholic comes in and sees him besmirching the name of Mother Mary. So he smashes the window and they challenge each other, each other to a duel to the death. And then all of society basically is trying to stop them from killing each other. And it becomes like kind of a, a bromance. They they kind of fall in love with each other as bros because like they're the only two that think this is important enough to like kill each other over. And everyone else is like, no, it's more important that just like nobody kills each other and just plays nice. But they're like, these ideas matter, you know. Yeah. And uh, they become brothers by the end of the book. It's really good. Um, but it's also a real comedy. It's really funny, fast moving. Um, but there's one of the, so they keep running into different people of different philosophies. And at one point they turn into a Tolstoy guy. The Tolstoy guy is, you know, pacifist and no government and all this stuff. And uh, but then at the moment that uh, I can't, I can't remember what they do, but he ends up calling the cops on him. So he's, he's playing with the idea that when it when it comes down to it, <laughs> the guy who's anti anti cop will will suddenly call the cops when they need him. <laughs> well, I, yeah, that is the kind of I, I wonder if that's the case. I know a lot of pacifists, and I'm not speaking for Tolstoy, of course, at all. Would rather take the punch in the face than, then, you know, then call the cops. Uh, right. I, I think a lot of, I, I mean, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of Christians too, who'd, who'd rather be like, I'd rather take the bullet, not literally, uh, mm -hmm. than kind of increase the amount of suffering out there and have a, my hand right. as a party to it. I have a sympathy towards pacifism. I, I get, it's one of those things where I go like, it could be right. I, I can't buy into it, but maybe I could. Uh, it's, it's one of those, you know, so I, I have sympathy for that. So but you're, you're a dad, aren't you? Yes. I think it's different when so you have kids. that's probably, yeah. I think it's very different. It's one thing very if different. someone, like you're in an event and someone shoves you and you're like, you know what? I'm not going to make this a big thing. I, I don't right, want to be shoved, right. but if I escalate, it's going to be worse. When kids are involved, it's like, yeah. no, 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 no. no. We're yeah. not doing this. And I'm certainly not setting that example for them to watch their dad be humiliated or hurt and just smile and nod. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> become protective <laughs> it's so, easy it's easy to have all these philosophies when you're just a single guy hanging out and doing whatever you know? <laughs> did chester never have any kids 
No, they couldn't have kids. Him and his wife, he loved children. He wanted children. Apparently they did have, uh, they had kids around the house all the time. And I think, I believe he fostered or had some, I don't know if he adopted, but uh, he's a big fan of kids. He really, I think that was one of their, the sad things, kind of the, but also a fascinating thing that he, he understood kids in a way that a lot of people don't seem to until they have them. He just, he really got it. Well, that sense of whimsy, which is throughout this book, is very much, and I get, I, people tell me this all the time. They're like, oh, grow up. And it's like, wait a minute, I don't have a boss. <laughs> I, I find joy you know, in a lot of things. Why would I give that up to have an alarm clock and a boss and, and kind of have this mundane existence? Whereas, you know, this may be childish in one sense, but mm -hmm. there is, it's certainly more joyous and, 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 you know, I think more in line with the world as it is. It, I don't think life is meant to be lived in a cubicle. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, yeah, I love his, his sense of joy and just, and, and also the difference between being immature and childish rather than thinking like a child, having that wonder. And, uh, you know, there's a difference between not being a man, not growing up, not, you know, not taking responsibility and, uh, and yet still being able to revel in, in wonder at things and have fun, you know, not yeah. take yourself too seriously. What was the best Christmas present you've ever gotten? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the most memorable was when the Super Nintendo came out and we, uh, we drove two hours to the nearest like actual city to buy one. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I, that I, was Christmas. I, I can relate to that very, That very was an well. exciting day. And, and did you go and beat Mario World in like a week? We played it obsessively. I can't remember. Or was Mario 3? Never... Was it Mario 3 or Mario World? Yeah, it was, came... I think it was 3 that came out with Super Nintendo. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. I was never a big game beater. I didn't beat oh. many games. I didn't have the... I don't know why. I never beat a lot of them. My brother would. <laughs> Maybe it was it. He was more competitive in that way. It's like... A, it's Mario. This isn't like, you know, yeah. the, the Olympics. My dad, uh, he he would play Mario one every morning and recite scripture from memory. He would he would recite all of like Philippians from memory, and he would defeat Mario repeatedly without getting a mushroom. So small oh, Mario, okay, perfect, perfect all the way through. Never got hit once, and he, and and his main score he was now keeping. He'd gotten so good at it was how many times he could cycle through the entire game without dying as little Mario. <laughs> wow. Okay. That, that's, that's, that's weird. A... I have those genes, but I... <laughs> There's a lot of those little speed runs on, um, on YouTube where people do little things like that. Mm. Um, Ethan, we're running out of time. Oh. What has been your favorite part of this interview? Oh, I love when you like, put me on the spot about Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs>